Okay, so uh, let's welcome uh, Igor, our uh, opening talk uh, speaker. He has some new things to tell us and continue. I will try to say new things, but actually I will just go around the things I said before. But I will try to give more details. Um, please forgive me if um, it's, it's not going to be a very organized talk. It's end of the day, and I will leave more space for questions. I think you will have them, I hope. Um, first, the disclaimer, everything I will say now may not work for you, for a number of reasons. Well, it's going to be a, a proposal for programmers, how they should work instead of how they work now, and that's why most likely if you do that, they may fire you. So try to, I mean, listen, and uh, if you're a manager, if you're managing people, then, then you can try to implement it in your real life. If you're just a programmer, and if you start doing that in your, in your office, in your day work, then you may have trouble. But in, in our company where we manage programmers, we do exactly what I will tell you today. We work exactly like that. We encourage people to think like that, to do things which I'll propose you, and to work like that. And it, ha and it works. It works, everything is good, and everybody is happy, including managers and programmers and architects and customers. But if you just apply it blindly, you may have problem. A few words about myself, again, maybe you've been on the first talk, but I'll repeat. I'm a programmer, I write code, this is my GitHub account, I have over a thousand followers there, so I do create some code, and I, uh, I'm not going to lie to you, I mean, I'm not just saying, I'm writing code. I also have some reputation on Stack Overflow, which is also not so small, so I answer questions sometimes about programming, and I ask questions sometimes on Stack Overflow, and I was also quite active on the, um, the Stack Exchange side about project management. Uh, I, even, I even was a moderator there some time ago. Uh, I'm also a certified Oracle architect, which is also a title, which means that I know a few things about Java and the architecture in general, and I wrote a few books about object-oriented programming, which are also quite controversial for some of, of you, may, but you may definitely want to to try to read them, they may change your understanding of object-oriented programming. But we're not going to talk about OOP now, we're going to talk about two things, manageability and maintainability, which I think are the core important components of any software development project. So we as programmers and managers, as ma how many managers are here, by the way? One, okay, good, so that's not so many. So all other people are programmers, you're just only writing code and never telling other programmers what to do, am I right? Not even architects. Or you have, or there are some, okay, who are team leads? Who are telling other programmers what to do? Okay, more. Why didn't you raise your hand before? What's the difference? <laughs> so you think a manager is a manager and a team lead is a team lead. It's two, two different things, right? It's the same. So if you tell somebody what to do, then you're a manager. If, you, if somebody listens to you and asks you in the morning, okay, what's the plan for today? Okay, what are we going to do today? Then you are a manager, no matter what you call yourself, a leader, an architect, or whatever. But you're managing things. Okay, so uh, manageability and maintainability. Maintainability is, uh, you probably know what it is, right? So maintainability is, as far as I understand, is how fast somebody else can understand your code and modify it. So if I write something, it's good, it works for me on my laptop. When I give it to somebody else and that person says, well, it will take me a month to do something with that, then the maintainability of this code is a month. If that person says, okay, sure, I get it, give me a few hours and I'll modify it, then the maintainability is higher. It's obvious for me and it should be obvious for you that the, the, the higher the maintainability, the better programmers you are, the better you organize your project. If the maintainability is low, if a new person goes into your project and says, I need about a month to understand what's going on here, who is doing a bad job here? You. So it's your fault that the maintainability of the code is low. You understand? Manageability means that if I'm a manager, then for me it's easy to manage you as a programmer. So let's say I have five programmers around me, and they do something, and they never tell me what's going on. Then the manageability is low. Like they're working, working, and every time I ask them, what's going on, guys, where you are, they're saying, I can't tell you. It's too difficult to explain. Just leave us alone. We'll do it ourselves. The manageability of this situation is very low. 
manageability is high when it's absolutely clear for me as a manager what's going on. So I know when we're going to finish. I know what are the problems. I know how much more hours, days, or lines of code, approximately, it will take to finish that. That means high manageability. Of course, it's obvious we want to aim for high manageability and high maintainability. Everything else is secondary. Performance, cost, speed of delivery, stability, everything else, all other metrics are secondary, in my opinion. These, are, these things are the primary important. And we're going to talk now about these social technical skills, which I mentioned on the first talk, which are important in order to increase manageability and maintainability. I'll show you the tweet uh, we discussed in the morning. And we'll try to give an answer to this tweet in a more detailed way. Uh, the question was, imagine you have a bug, you, you have fixed a bug, you have to fix a bug, but you can't understand how the code works, so you don't know this code. So obviously, as you know, understand, maintainability is low. So if you open the code and you have to fix the bug, but you can't understand what's going on, what is the problem? The problem is not the bug. The problem is that the maintainability is low, so you don't understand what to do. It means that we'll see now what it means. So the majority of people gave the wrong answer, in my opinion. So they just said, ask its author. You now probably understand why it's a wrong answer, because instead of fixing the real problem, which is maintainability, they are just asking the author, getting an answer, and fixing the bug. The core problem stays with the source code. We still have the same mess instead of a code. Tomorrow, somebody else will come in, try to fix another bug, and they will see another same problem. They will again ask somebody, blah, blah. We should work differently, and I'll show you how we should work. So this behavior, in my opinion, is irresponsible and incorrect. It damages the project. It's not manageable, and it's not, uh, it doesn't help the maintainability. So I'll show, I'll show you six, six different, uh, not steps, but six different uh, methods of how you can deal with that situation, how we encourage our programmers to deal with that situation, and you will see whether it's applicable to your case or not. Step number one, we're telling them, look, if something you don't understand, if you don't understand the code, if you need to fix the bug, so don't blame yourself for that. It's not your fault. It's not your job to understand everything. It's not your job to be a smart programmer here. It's not your job to know everything. It's not your job to learn everything in this code. Your job is to fix the bug which we have or implement the feature which you, which you need to implement. Blame us, the, the code around you, for not maintaining it in a, proper, in a proper quality. So demand us to clean up the mess around the, the, around the bug you have and then let you work on the bug. So we're asking programmers, don't jump in and fix the problem. If you see that the problem is bigger than the, than, the, than, the, than the job you're assigned to. So you are assigned to implement this particular feature. But you see that everything around this feature is not clear. The code is messy. The maintainability is low. You see that maintainability is low. Return back to us the problem. Be manageable as a programmer. Because for the manager, it's better to, if you behave like that. If I give you my, if I'm a good manager, if I give you the task and I say fix it, and you come back to me in half an hour and say, look, I can't fix it like you expected me to fix it in, a, in half a day. I can't do it because this, 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 and that around my part is broken, it's messy. I don't understand how it works. So for me, I know now, okay, I had one task, now I have seven tasks. One plus six or whatever you identified. You said, here is not clear, here is not clear, and there is not clear. So I had one problem, now I have seven problems, but the situation is manageable. I know why I have seven problems. I need to clean up the mess around that, and then that original problem will be fixed. So that way you're helping me to manage the project. So we tell them, every time bring back uh, the problem to us. Don't hide the fact that maintainability is low. Don't make it invisible to everybody. Don't, don't say like, eh, yeah, probably I'm too stupid. I will spend more time to understand it. I need to work more, and then eventually I will understand. Don't do that. Don't blame, don't blame yourself. You're not supposed to be smart. That's, that's, the, that's the mindset. You're supposed to fix the problem. So if you feel that I'm not smart enough, most likely it's not your problem. It's the problem of the code. The code has to be so clean that even a junior programmer We'll understand it immediately, how it works, all the algorithms, all the connections between components, all the dependencies, everything is so obvious. You just open it, oh, sure, I need to fix it here. 
This is the unit test. I run it. How do I run it? I click here. It's explained. It runs. It fails. It breaks. I, I change the line, this line to that line. The code works. It should be like that. If it's not like that, blame the project. And we say, this is, I'm going to give you a few quotes, which you can remember or tweet. So if you don't know how the code works, it's a fault of the code, not you. Who think or thought differently before, before, before today? Quite a few. Okay. Me as well. Not before today, but <laughs> I also... <laughs> I also had the mentality of this hero, you know, the hero-driven development, people sometimes say. So we all feel like we want to be, you know, we want to be a hero. Something is difficult to solve. That's great. We, we, are like, to work, we like to work complex problems. It's messy, but I'm so good that I can fix that. It's wrong. You, you, you do a really bad favor to the project. You do a bad favor for maintainability. The code gets messy and messy and messy. And it's a bit bad for managers because managers don't understand what you're working on. I gave that person a bug, which is supposed to be small, and he's there for five days already. So what's going on? Ah, oh, he re actually rewriting the whole building system, you know, or, build, or maybe rewriting the whole algorithm for sorting. I don't know what he's doing, but he's rewriting something, obviously. And when I ask what's going on, he says, yeah, I'm, you know, in this, uh, in this video, I, I didn't post it here, but it was a funny video on the internet a few months ago I saw. Then the wife asks her husband to fix a lamp, in the room, and then he starts fixing it, and he realizes that he needs a, a screwdriver or something. So he goes back to the, to the room where the screwdrivers are, and he's trying to open the, uh, the box with the screwdrivers, but it's broken. So it goes somewhere else, he gets something else to fix the box. And when he gets that, he needs to fix something else. So finally, the wife, the wife finds him somewhere in the garage fixing the car. And she says, look, I asked you to change the lamp. And he says, what do you think I'm doing? So he's obviously fixing the lamp, but it takes so many steps, you know, and, he doesn't, and she doesn't understand what's going on. This is the perfect example of unmanageable project. She was a manager. She asked, just change the lamp. And instead of coming back and saying, you know, darling, to fix the lamp, I need to do something else. How about that? Should I continue? I mean, now we have two tasks. And then she would say, like, forget the lamp, let's do something else. Instead, he hides the fact that the something else is broken and starts doing it, starts doing it, starts doing it. It's unmanageable. Step number two, let's say that code is clean and it's more or less understand, you can understand it. Um, so the code, the code is clean, so they fixed the problem. They fixed it for you. And now what do you do? You still have a problem. You still don't, underst you still, uh, don't have the, uh, the understanding of, of how to fix the problem. Uh, we say, step number two, demand better documentation and wait. Every time you wait, actually. So you try to be, the whole mentality behind that advice, is, advice I'm giving is that you try to be as lazy as possible every time. You can't fix the lamp, okay, I'm not going to fix the lamp. You can't fix the bug, I'm not going to fix the bug. You're trying to return it back to management and doing it in a lazy mentality. So be as lazy as possible. So you do something, you fix something, you implement something only when everything is perfectly prepared for it, for it and you know exactly what to do. If it's not the case, try to push back as much as possible. So demand the documentation. Uh, this is important important thing to mention that I believe that now we write code, like I said in the morning, now we write code for people. We used to write code for computers years ago. Now we write code for people. It's way more important that our code is understandable by fellow programmers than to make the code understandable by computers. Because people are way more expensive, computers are easier to replace. If the code is you know, not so easy for a computer to understand, if it's slow, if performance sucks, if something is wrong technically, computers can easily handle that. People are way more expensive. If you write some mess and then nobody can maintain that, it's a huge financial uh, damage for the project because we need to hire somebody else and pay exactly or more money to rewrite the whole thing. So we need to write for people. So if you see the code which is not, which doesn't, which is not documented, I mean the source code. I'm not talking about this Microsoft Word documentation pages, but I mean the source code. If you don't understand, if, if it doesn't have enough documentation, then also you have all the right to say, I'm not going to fix the bug in a class which is not documented. Let's ask somebody to document it for me first. And when it comes back to me with the proper documentation explaining how all the pieces work, then I will fix something. 
Again, like I said, the management may fire you for that, but if the management is smart enough, and if you train the management in the right way, and if you are the management, if you work together with them, then you will understand, and for them it's, it's good that if you come back to them with that information. So if you don't understand something, it's a bug, and it's not your fault. The project doesn't need you to be smart, it needs maintainable code. That's a quote I would say, my word. So don't, be, don't try to be smart, make sure the code is maintainable. Step number three, let's say the code is documented, let's say the code is clean, everything is good, but you still cannot, um, you still not, uh, you still not have enough time to fix the, the problem which you have. So you have a bug, they assigned it to you, but you don't have enough time, or you're, you're lazy and how to apply this laziness to the, <laughs> to the work environment. So I would say, reproduce the bug and call it a day. So fixing the bug completely may be too much for you at one go. To make, the, 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 to make yourself more manageable for the team, it's better to just reproduce it in the unit test. By reproduce, I mean the unit test. So write the unit test, create, you know, make sure you reproduce the problem, and then you don't need to fix it. You can return it back and say, you know what? I did the hard work. I did the most complex part. Now somebody else can continue. You will also have to help the management in this case. They will know that you actually break down the, the, the work into smaller parts. The first part is reproducing the bug, and then the fixing part goes. And actually, I think that repro to reproduce the bug, it's 80% it's, it's of success. 80% of, of, of work when we need to fix the bug. So... Um, we, need, we don't need to be, uh, again, here, this hero mentality. Don't, don't be a hero and fix everything in one go. Instead, when you see a problem, it's good contribution to the project to reproduce the problem in automated test. Because when something, when something is broken, when something doesn't work, it's, it mostly is a problem of a unit testing fray, of a unit testing um, layer. Let's put it this way. So we have a code and we have unit tests that protect that code against bugs. So if we have a bug, if the code doesn't work as expected, it means that the testing layer is weak. It's not strong enough. Otherwise, how would that bug show up in there? It means that we created the code and we didn't create enough unit tests to cover the functionality to make sure it works. So of course, the right step is to fix the the problem in the testing layer. And then the problem in the code will be the secondary step, which somebody else can do. By this way, by doing, by, by approaching tasks like that, by trying to break them always, to break them, to decompose them into pieces, you help your managers to see the project as a more manageable thing. So catching a bug with an automated test is a bigger achievement than fixing the bug. That's what I think. Catching, because it's, if, if it wasn't, if, it, if we were not catching it before, then something is wrong in the testing layer. When you fix the testing layer, you do a big favor to the project, way bigger than the fix of the bug itself. So let's say, let's go to the next step. Let's say you, uh, you can't reproduce a bug. So you're trying to create a test. You know there is a bug, so somebody tell, tells you, the customer says, I'm clicking this button on the screen and I cannot uh, open the window. I'm, I click and, and the window doesn't open. This is the report, this is the bug report you got from the customer support. And you're trying to create the automated test and you can't. I mean, you, you create a test and the test passes. So you do open the window in the test. So what do you do in this case? Again. Don't sit and wait and, and spend time and investigate and research and blame yourself for this problem. I would suggest in this case, it happens in our projects sometimes. We, we, are, we are working sometimes in open, with open source stuff as well. So we have open source projects where people report bugs like insane. Sometimes they're just dropping us bugs saying that the whole thing doesn't work, I cannot run your library, do whatever you want with this. And then you just face the situation, you give this bug to somebody and that programmer has to fix it. But the programmer says, I, I, I cannot fix it because there is no bug. Yes, I understand the report, something doesn't work, but on my computer it works. So what do you do? In this case, I'm suggesting, my, my suggestion is create a test that perfectly proves that there is no bug. And, and close the ticket and blame the customer for it. 
it could be, yeah, this could be a conflict between the interest of the business and the interest of pro programmers. How you resolve that, that's outside of the scope of this discussion. That's a problem of the business. But for us programmers, I think in this case, we, are, we need to move incrementally. So every time they blame us for something doesn't work, we clean the code, we clean the documentation, we do the previous steps I explained. Clean the code, clean documentation, reproduce the bug in the test. If you can't reproduce it, create an additional test and say, hey, it works in the, our unit testing setup, and return it back. They will come back again and say, no, 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 it doesn't work. And here's the additional requirement, the additional situation. I'll explain you in which particular situation it doesn't work. You have to be logged in with this particular customer name. In that case, you click the button and the window doesn't open. And then you try to reproduce it again. And you say, no, in the unit test, again, it works. I try to log in with this customer name. Still works. Back to you. They come back to you again and say, no, 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 no. You need to have some money on your account. In this case, the button doesn't click. So back and forth, back and forth, it's a manageable situation. If you behave like that as a programmer, if you're always trying to push it back to them, you help them to manage the whole project. Instead of sitting and thinking and trying to experiment and waiting and taking time, instead, push it back. They will bring it back to you as well, if the manager understands this philosophy. Of course, if the manager is not like is not thinking like that, then they will just blame you for, and they will blame you for everything. So a new passing test is a good response to a bug that you can't catch with a unit test. If you can catch it, create a new test. Let's say you create a new test. So you have a new test. You prove that, that the bug doesn't work, but they still want you to uh, they still want you to, to finish it. So they're back and forth, back and forth. They come back to you and say, there's still a bug. It needs to be fixed. And you say, no, it doesn't work. I mean, it works for us. We reproduce it in all possible ways. So what do you do? I'm suggesting to my programmers just disable the feature and say, OK, it's not a feature anymore. It doesn't work. I mean, it's not like disable it at all. So remove it from the code. Because you need to deliver the code. You need to deliver the product to production. So we are using feature toggles for that quite often. Do you know what feature toggles are? You know, right? So sometimes the bug is not fixable. It, takes, it may take some time, which we don't know how long. And it happens sometimes. So instead of, again, instead of investigating and, 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 and keeping everybody in the waiting mode, we suggest uh, our technical engineers to disable the feature temporarily and say, OK, this feature doesn't work. Uh, put the, the feature toggle in the code. Feature toggle is like a um, uh, trigger in the code. Which, uh, which you deploy to production, so the code stays in the code base, the product goes to production, but customers cannot use it unless, until you uh, remove the trigger, and until you remove this uh, marker in the code, which will allow the block of code to work again. So that's, a, again, perfectly legal solution. We can't fix, we're not magicians, not everything can be fixed, we cannot do magic. Sometimes we can't do anything, so yes, we understand it's a bug, we admit it, but we uh, disable the feature and put the code uh, to production. Um, so that's the, the mantra. Keep the code clean and close tickets in a reasonable amount of time. Let them worry about customers. Maybe it sounds a little bit against the business, but this is how it should, it should be. They worry about customers. We worry about the clean code. We worry about fast response. They bring us the problem. We do everything we can and we return it back. If the problem is not fixable, we disable the feature, but still return it back. So we don't hold the product for too long. We don't hold tickets in our hands for too long. We want to close them as, po as soon as possible. That's the mentality. The faster you close tickets, the faster you return back control and responsibility from your shoulders to the shoulders of your manager, the better programmers you are, the more manageable you are. The more I can rely on you. If I'm a manager, I cannot rely on somebody who is, every time I'm asking to do something, says, OK, I'll do it, and no answer for hours and days. And then I have to start micromanaging that person. I have to come, back, come to that person back and say, OK, tell me what are you doing right now? Why it takes two days already? And then I find out that he's somewhere in the garage already, fixing something else. It's unmanageable. <laughs> yeah, these people are unmanageable. I've seen them many times. Probably you know what I'm talking about. Manageable people is when they hit the problem, when they hit something which is not solvable in a given amount of time. They say, hey, I, don't wanna, I can't work anymore. I stop. Give me something else. And then it's my problem what to do with this situation. Maybe give it back to the same person or to somebody else or resolve. But we're not doing that for a number of psychological reasons. 
First of all, we don't like to look not smart, right? We don't like to look like somebody who can't solve problems, like that husband with the lamp. So he didn't want to look like he can't change the lamp, right? Okay, I'll change it, of course, even if it takes, you know, to repair the car. I'll do everything to change the lamp. In the end, what do we have? No lamp, no car, nothing. So we don't want to look, to look stupid, just uh, purely psychologically. And that's wrong. So don't expect, the, like I said, the project doesn't expect you to be smart. The project expects you to solve problems. Another reason is most probably we, um, we are sometimes uh, are perfectionists. And we don't want to, to return back the problem in an, un, in an uh, unfinished state. So they gave me the bug. And what does it mean, like, I can't fix the bug? Okay, maybe I don't want to be the smartest guy, but still, I, I, I want to finish it because I don't want to say, like, hey, I created a test, and then somebody else will fix that. I want to test, and I want to fix it. So I want to completely perfect, com uh, finished solution. It's also wrong. It feels good for you, but it's bad for the project. The project wants you to be manageable. Manageability means decomposition of bigger tasks into smaller ones. So help the manager to decompose problems and, and manage them. Okay, and the final point is say no. Sometimes, and quite often, well, it depends on your, on your uh, skills, uh, we cannot solve it at all. I mean, we cannot write a test, we cannot fix the problem, we can even disable the feature. Sometimes we have to say no. Like, say, like in my morning example, when they give me the task for the Python and I'm a Java programmer, it's perfectly legal to say, I cannot do that. I mean, find somebody else. Again, if you keep saying that in your team, then most likely you will have problems with the management. But if the management properly understands this idea that the right people have to be at the right places, that if this person is not a Python developer, then probably it's better to maybe find another place for that person, maybe find another person for that place, but do something with that. So don't be a hero, don't try to solve all problems they give to you, all tickets they assign to you. We in our management and bureaucracy, we even encourage people, not encourage, but we allow people to reject tasks immediately. So we give the task to a programmer and the programmer can say, I'm not gonna work on this task, give me something else. And it doesn't cost a programmer anything. I mean, it's just, it's just a, a legal decision of a programmer to say, no, give me, new, give, me, give me a new one. No, give me a new one. Sometimes we have tasks which are bounced by a number of people. So we, it gets assigned to somebody, and the answer is no. It gets assigned to somebody, and the answer is no. One, two, three, and then it becomes a problem of a manager, of the architect, actually. And then the architect takes a look at this problem and says, okay, it looks like it's too complex. Maybe we need to give more time for this task. Maybe we need to find somebody else with the proper, with the proper uh, spe specialization for this task. So saying no by saying no, you are helping management. You are helping your manager to see what's going on and to make the right management decision. When you're saying, sure, we'll fix everything, we are, like I said in the morning, we are good people, talented programmers, we're super motivated to fix whatever you give us. Why do you need manager in this case? The manager doesn't know what to do in that because he doesn't know or she doesn't know wh what exactly my team is capable of. Everything? I highly doubt it. So there are some limits, and the team, the responsibility of programmers is to define that limits and say where, we are, where our limits end, what can we do and what we cannot do. So here's the, the quote. Being a professional developer doesn't mean being able to fix any problem. Actually, being a professional developer means knowing exactly and not being afraid of saying what I cannot do. So a professional developer will say, I, I can do this and I cannot do that. And I'm pretty much sure about my limits. I know exactly where is the border. But not professional people saying, sure, just give more, give me more, I'll fix everything. In the end, the project fails because of that irresponsible behavior. So not being able to say no, it's irresponsible. And now let's take a look at this tweet. And let's, I, I finished with the six points. They started from cleaning up the mess up to saying no. And now I'm wrapping up. So let's take a look at this tweet. And, and now I'll ask you to give me the, what you think is the right question. What's wrong with this, with this answer? So uh, here's the task. I'm a Python developer. And the task is about, no, I'm a Java developer. And the task is about some Python. So what do I do if I'm a responsible programmer? 
I think it's obvious. You answer them number four. You email the recruiter. I mean, it's a joke here, but it means that you give back the information to the manager that, look, there is some uh, inconsistency. There is some mistake being made. I'm not a Python developer. You gave me the Python task. Let's do some changes. So that was, that, that's the right task. What most people are doing, Google, 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 Google. That's irresponsible. There's not professional behavior. Something is wrong already. You already see that, that you're at the wrong place. You're not supposed to be there. So why are you Googling it? What, what's going on? Are you in school? Are you going to learn Python, being on the, on the salary of the project? That's, you're kind of abusing the, the, the trust we gave you. The project trusted you for some reason, gave you some budget, gave you some you know, money and time, and you're like in this money and time, you're Googling and learning and becoming a Python developer. This is not what a manager would expect you to do. The manager would expect to say, hey, hey, no, stop, let's change horses. We need somebody else. So that's my point. Don't be a hero. That's what I'm saying. Don't be a hero. The project, a good project doesn't expect you to be a hero. Bad managers, badly managed projects definitely expect that heroes. They don't know how to manage projects, actually. The majority of managers are, like we've seen before, they're not really managers. They just think they're, yeah, we give instructions to people, but we're not managers. So the majority of this management layer, they don't have any special management education at all. They just, you know, they are the most trustable people in the room, and that's why they are team leads, and that's why they're trying to put things together and somehow manage this group of developers. Unfortunately, that's the situation in the, in the market now, in the industry now. We don't have professional management layer, especially in software development. We have them in like building, in, uh, you know, in the bigger projects, in medicine, in, in, in construction. They have professional project managers because it's, maybe it's more critical there. I don't know why. But for software development, we have programmers becoming managers and then they're becoming programmers again. So they're not really professional project managers. So they don't know how to manage anyone who is not a hero. So all the management, especially thanks to Agile, is about finding talented people who will fix everything somehow, because they're talented people. And, and it's not, in our case, it doesn't work like that. We cannot rely on that. The situation is completely unmanageable. The situation is not transparent. We don't see what's going on. So I'm suggesting you to do differently and to don't be heroes on one side. And when you manage programmers, ask them also not to be heroes, not to try to, you know, to, 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 to look smart and to look like they can fix everything. Instead, they need the social technical skills of how to return back uh, their problems to management, how to communicate with the management in the right way. Um, that's probably it. We have time for questions. What do you think? Did I hit the... Did you agree? Let's, let me ask you this. Yeah. Okay. The questions, right? Not just answers to my question. Okay. Do you have questions? Uh, you asked the question in the middle of the presentation. Why do we need managers? Yeah. Why do we need managers? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Actually, uh, I think we don't need them. That's my personal opinion. I mean, we don't need, we don't, I think that, I think that management, project management is a pretty routine and boring task, if you do it right. If you do the management right, if I'm not talking about this cheerleading and just, uh, you know, cheering everybody up and, and coming to the office in the morning and helping them make coffee and say, we have huge goals and we will achieve, you know, uh, we will be next Google in a few months. So if you remove that and you really focus on managing tasks, then we can, we can place computers at that position. That's exactly what my company is doing. Xerocracy is exactly that. We are removing project management layer and we're putting uh, robots at that position. So computers manage programmers. Because like you said, that's a good question. Why do we need managers? If programmers really communicate and behave professionally, then it will be very easy to automate management of them. If they, you know, do only the work they like, if they only uh, solve the problems which they like, if they always return back their tasks if something is not clear, then we will see a huge amount of small, small tasks which are easy to automate the management of them, the dispatching of them. So I agree, the, 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 the modern situation on the market, this layer of management, I think it's very unprofessional and we need to do everything we can to remove that. More? Yeah. Yeah, I'll repeat the question, yeah. 
Yeah, the question is we have uh, now it's a tendency to have full stack developers. So people who can fix JavaScript at the same time, uh, Python backend, and at the same time write some HTML and CSS. Well, that's, that's unfortunate because, uh, because we are not yet ready to work with freelancers. So the majority, the majority of situations when we need something to be done, we find somebody and we start paying full time. For, for, for that person. So we get somebody full time. And of course, if the project is small, so we need just, you know, we have a budget for one or two people. So of course, we cannot have HTML designer, CSS designer, JavaScript designer, and then a Python developer. So we, can end, we cannot have five people. That's why we hire one person who will cover all these five roles and will work full time. That's because we work full time. I think that's the core problem. So if we move to the next level, if we move to the next step in our industry, in our, in our uh, domain, and we start working with freelancers where you will get two hours of work for today on, on CSS and then one hour next week, but at the same time you will have 15 projects running about CSS and you will have multiple tasks about CSS from different projects and you will have an ability to work like that. You know, you will, need, you will not need to constantly find new customers, you will not be bothered by 15 managers, who will call you for 15 meetings a day, because now management is about meetings and meetings and meetings. So you cannot work on 15 projects. It's technically not possible. You will spend a lot of time on meetings. So if you move, if we all move to the next level of management, which we are trying to do, then it will be possible. We will be one programmer, Python, sitting in 15 projects, having no meetings, just getting tasks, and doing just Python work. And then another programmer doing just JavaScript in, in the same 15 projects. Then it will be solvable. Now we have so-called jacks of all trades, full stack developers, which I think is unfortunate. I don't like that. Why do you think we reach to this situation about the management? When? Why do you think we reach at this situation with the management? You mean why do I think that we will get there and the management? No, will... no. Why we are now? Why we are not? Why we have it right now? Yes. Because I recognize the situation when I'm work. Also, the client doesn't want to pay for a, a scrum master or a team leader. Mm -hmm. And uh, after, okay, you do it a trial and show him what, what the visibility that uh, he is going to get when he'll have a, okay, I want that. Mm -hmm. But before, no, it's too expensive. So the question is, why do we have this situation with the management now? And it seems that customers actually want to have that management, right? So they cannot work without that. So they want these Scrum Masters. They work somehow, they work somehow yeah. I think that we are now somewhere in this transition period, but that's my understanding. So we, we, we the, 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 um, the industry is young, I think so. I'm, I'm just now making it up. I never thought about that before. So I'm, I think that the industry is quite young and uh, we are, uh, and, it, and it changes frequently. It changes really fast. So we have new technologies, we have new formats of work, we have this agile scrum, it's like 10 years old, not maybe, maybe a little bit more. So we have these new management ideas, and, uh, uh, and at the same time, programmers are getting more and more expensive, and the amount of work on the market is growing fast, so we need more programmers than we can actually find in universities and on the market. So it means that we have uh, a lot of money in the industry. And uh, having this a lot of money, customers are not now interested or motivated to fix anything. They, don't, they see problems, they understand that this management layer is a burden, they understand that it's just a redundancy, they understand it's bad, it's not professional, they understand that in order to fix one problem they need to hire three people and then they will be full stack and they will do you know, almost nothing, fixing these lamps for weeks and weeks. We had the previous talk at this room, it was pretty much about that, daily rates, remember? So we, our customers understand that, that they burn a lot of money on us, on programmers. But they can't do anything and they don't want to do anything because they have money. They have enough money now. So the, 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 the industry is now growing like, growing like that. We have, we have more and more uh, uh, clients, we have more and more projects, we have more and more budgets. And that's why programmers are lazy now. And managers are these parasites, you know, who are basically earning money on us. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's what we have. And because of that huge amount of money, which is growing every day, we have this. The, the, moment, the moment the crisis will show up, maybe the crisis it will slow down a little bit, then the management, the, the customers will start thinking, like, why am I paying this so much money for, you know, for solving so small amount of problems? 
So for now, it's quite difficult. So for now, for example, in my company, in Zerocracy, our biggest competitor is not like other like freelance platforms or something. It's the market. So my biggest enemy and competitor are those big, huge companies who are paying their developers huge monthly salaries and saying, yeah, sure, fix that lamp for a month. I don't care as long as you are a good, talented developer. Yeah, and they call themselves talented and they sit there for months fixing the lamp. So this bad, and then when they come to us and we say, no, 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 we have a different mentality. We want you to go back and forth, back and forth, and fixing, you know, these small problems and be manageable. Programmers say, yeah, really, why? This big company, Google pays me a huge amount of money every month. Why do I need to work at all? That's, that's, that's what we have now. The moment Google and other big companies stop paying that big budgets and start demanding more from programmers, at that moment we will see some change, I think. Yeah. How do we define... Uh, that fine limit between being a hero, hero, uh, and not, because we'll try to implement in a wrong way. We'll we'll end up in another company, and then another company, and then another city. So the, the, the first part of the question: How can I? How can we define that fine limit between being a hero? Ah, being a hero, and okay, yeah. So how can we define the limit? Uh, like I said before in the beginning, it depends on your management. So if your management is uh, weak. If your management doesn't really, cannot really manage you. So I would suggest you to be a hero, actually. That's the way you can get, you know, good salary. That's the way you can stay in the company for a long time. Like, pretend that you're a hero. Always say, like, yeah, yeah, I'm busy working on this problem. I will fix it. Just give me more time. That, that, will, be, that will be good for you, like, personally. But if we're, talking, if we're talking about the combination of a manager and programmer, if, if you would be, like, part of one project, then I would say that the less hero you are, the better. In our case, in our company, I'll give you an example. You will see how extreme we are. We give programmers 30 minutes for each problem. 30 minutes. Not a day, not a week, but 30 minutes. Half an hour. So no matter what is the problem, you get half an hour. So you have to finish it in half an hour. If you don't finish in half an hour, it's your problem. We're going to pay you only for half an hour. So our programmers, they are so strictly motivated by us to, to return back the problem to us in half an hour. So they cannot be heroes at all. Absolutely. They cannot say, oh, yeah, I found a solution. Give me a week. There's no week. We have half an hour. And you need to finish it in half an hour. And then somebody else will pick it up. Most likely, it's not going to be you. So our mentality is completely opposite to the hero mentality. So answering your question, how extreme it can go, to the maximum. To the complete extreme, where you're fixing what you can fix, and then returning it back. But of course, to get there, it's not so easy. It needs, it needs a lot of understanding from the management layer, or complete removal of the management layer. Hi. Uh, if you go back to your example of uh, saying I'm a Java developer and I get a Python task, or was it the, the other way yeah. around? Uh, if I want to expand my knowledge, uh, this implies, your example implies that I'm not using company budget to, to do that. I would do that on some, say, personal budget or some sort. That's so, right. Right? Yes, yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. So I think that's a good question. So of course, so the question is, so when will I actually Google, Google, and Google? So I want to learn Python, right? It's, Python is just an example. But I want to learn some new libraries. I want to need to learn some new technologies. Of course, I want that. So I think that the right way is to uh, work for somebody some amount of time with big rates. And then another half of your time spent on learning and, and investigating and, you know, just uh, uh, studying some new technologies. Because now what we have, we sit in the office for eight hours and we use seven hours of that time for self-education and for Twitter, like the, previous, like the previous talk mentioned. So we tweet, we go on Facebook, we learn, we self-educate, and then maybe one hour we do something for the company. Why? Because the company is paying us a small amount per hour. Because our hour costs, I don't know exactly how much it costs in Romania, but I guess it's somewhere around from 10 to 20 euros probably, or 10 to 20 dollars, something like that. And that's why we want to get 100, I don't know, 100 dollars a, a, a day, for example. But instead, we can say, hey, you know what, my rate is 100 an hour. I will work for you one hour, but I will really work. No Twitter, no learning. I will do just my stuff, which is Java. I know Java. I will do Java perfectly. I'm not going to be a hero. I'll be absolutely manageable, but pay me $100 an hour. 
Nobody will accept that. They will say, no, 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 we know what's going on. You will sit on, on Twitter, but you're gonna, we're going to pay you for 100 hours because they cannot manage you. The management is not ready. But that would be the ideal situation. That's what we are doing. We're paying good rates, but we are saying, you know, we're not paying you for learning. We're not paying you for Twitter time. It's your time. So take our money, work for us two, three hours a day, and then go home and learn. That's, I think, the right, the right model. What we have now is not the right model. So learning on the go, learning at work, is a very wrong approach, I think. I think that's the time for this talk. Uh, we are waiting for you at the panel in 15 minutes. Yeah, and thanks. We will we'll have a panel Igor here. And so the other speakers. Please join us. Thank you.